Hello and welcome to the Forehammer Podcast, episode 93. I'm your host, Brad. This is my co-host, Eric. How's it going? And on this episode, we've got a pretty chill one for you guys today. We're here live with a bunch of our patrons watching us. Well, listening to us. No one can see us. I'm naked. (laughs) Today we're going to be covering the sequel episode, the episode that everyone has wanted in some way. A sequel to which episode, you may ask? Yes. All of them. I'm sure we'll get fantastic feedback from this on sequel episodes, because sequels are always better. Yes, sequels always do better than the original of their topic, and naming an episode the sequel episode will in no way ruin our YouTube algorithm. No, absolutely not. This is just brilliant marketing on our side. All right, without any further ado, let's jump into this massive multi-topic. Sounds good. All right, before we get started, though, two seconds. If you're interested in buying merch from us, wait until tomorrow. Wait, that's going to sound really bad if you don't watch this on launch day. <laughs> Just keep <laughs> waiting wait until tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow Just comes, keep waiting till and you'll have to continue forever. waiting for t- tomorrow. <laughs> I'm the worst fucking salesman. Ricky is rolling in his non-existent grave. I'm sure he's so happy <laughs> that he teamed up with us. These idiots can't sell one t-shirt. They have 100,000 <laughs> views. Yeah, right. <laughs> Before we get started, though, if you are interested in getting any Poor Hammer merch, starting Wednesday, November 22nd, which is the day after this airs, hopefully, there will be a sale on Orchid 8 that is site-wide but includes us. If you order 100 bucks or more, it's 15% off. Yeah, it's a pretty good deal, actually. <laughs> and speaking of nice merch, we also will be launching... Well, we won't do shit. Bricky's going to do all the work for us and we're going to reap the rewards. There will be a new zip-up hoodie with the Porhammer logo on it, which launches with the sale on Wednesday, November 22nd. Which is super exciting. All right, enough shilling out, though. Let's get to the actual topic proper. All right, what do we have first in this follow-up sequel episode? Maybe start easy? Let's do a quick sequel sequel to the must have paints episode we did a couple months ago yeah i think you had bought a bunch of the ak paints immediately after we got feedback from people (laughs) i had actually bought them before before the episode aired, I think. I, yeah, I can't remember if it was like right before the episode or like right after. I thought it was right after when people were like, hey, AK is good. Yeah, I didn't actually get pressured into this by our audience. I got pressured into it by Ninjan releasing a video that week. Oh. Once again, talking about how much he loved his AK paints. And then I think Vince did like a week after I bought them too. And I was like, fine, all of you twist my arm. <laughs> I'll go spend a bunch of money. Yeah. I ended up buying more than I will admit to. I did not buy the whole set. I'm not insane. It was a box. (laughs) No, it was many smaller purchases. They didn't have a box set other than the whole thing that's a discount. And Eric, when I showed him the bill was like, you bought every paint. I was like, no, Eric, I bought like a fourth of them, maybe a sixth. (laughs) Yeah, but tell us your thoughts on it. Was it worth the money? Uh, yes. However, there is no magic paint. There are good paints, and these are very good paints. Okay. I'm not going to tell you to throw out your Pro Acryl and buy AK. I love my Pro Acryl and will continue using it. All right. AK is also extremely good, though. Man, are they also awesome. I am now painting up my corn demons. Orange is a key part of my corn scheme. Like, it's the main skin tone. And my orange skin is actually three AK paints after two Pro Acryl paints. Again, it's all airbrushed, so I'm not insane. This is still speed paintable. Right. Yeah, so I really like some of these AK paints that I've been using. There are a few amazing paints in this range, though. Like, Tenebrous Gray, that everyone kept on saying how good it was, turned out to be that good. It is like a really, really dark purple. Like, it is a gray, but it has purple undertones to it. And it looks so so good when you use it in shadows. Yeah, I mean, that is one of the things that when it comes to grays, usually you're looking for like tints of other colors and purple's tough. AK paints, fantastic. Have you used it basically only through airbrush? No, I hand painted my Tenebrous Gray where I used it on those models. Okay. And a couple of the beiges I was hand painting. Oh, and technically I dry brushed one of the yellows, but I don't think dry brushing really counts. All right, but let's move on from paints. Let's make a quick stop after being so positive to something here. A sequel to the 40K Factions of the Future episode we did, or the Missing Factions in 40K, or whatever I called that. 
that episode. Yeah, it was something like that. To you random pedants out there who will never watch this because you only watched a random episode from us and are not a regular listener, if you typed the sentence, Skaven exist in 40k, they're called the Imperium of Man. You're being reductive and a dumbass, and you need to be told this and shamed publicly. In no way is the Imperium of Man Skaven. Yes, I understand. There's a lot of them and it's really shitty, just like rats. That's fucking stupid. You know that, and yet you typed it. The Skaven are like the most technologically advanced of all of Warhammer Fantasy. Right, which is just like the Imperium. <laughs> yeah, famously advanced. <laughs> The Skaven are cute little rat boys who say funny things like yes, yes, and murder kill. The Imperium says cringe stuff. The Skaven celebrate different types of being Skaven between the religious magical part, the tech-oriented part, eating warp stone, the warmongering part, and all of this fun stuff in between. The Imperium is a boring mass of just throw bodies at it in various amounts of metal suits. Or in lack of metal suit, depending on how useful you are. Skaven can also tell you how their tech works. It won't make any sense, but they can tell you, and it probably involves a ton of warp stone. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I feel like the Skaven tech is mostly a uh, fever dream of drug addicts, but maybe that's better than the magic Christmas land, let's pray to the random piece of metal. Corpse Emperor, say it, say it. It's the Corpse Emperor, soon to be fifth uh, chaos god. True. <laughs> <laughs> All right, enough making fun of you idiots. Skaven are awesome. The Imperium sucks. End of discussion. Don't at me. Or at me. It's free engagement. You lose either way. Moving on from the uh, super intelligent comment section that is YouTube comments to uh, Brad, you had a huge big brain moment on one episode and uh, let's hear about the Tyranid update for every faction wish. But which of the million times of me being amazing are we talking about? Just that one. Which? There are so many. No, no. Just that one about the Tyranid update. You know, the Norn Emissary and the Forge World becoming plastic and, you know, that one. So when we did the wish for a new model for every faction, I somehow insanely closely called the Norn Emissary to the point where I even wished up, let's just get rid of one of the Forge World models and plasticify it into a new model. And they got rid of the Demacarian and made it into the Norn Assimilator. So yeah, we probably should do an update just for Tyranids there because accidentally nailed it. I didn't actually think of this in advance, so let's brainstorm for a moment on what Tyranids could actually use still. That's not just a range refresh for something that got forgotten. We know the Hive Tyrant is small. Yeah, I mean, there's still many things that can be updated and uh, brought to modern standards, but there are rules to that episode about new things. Uh, it feels like cheating to say I want a Bug Dragon, because everyone's just going to point to the Forge World Ancient one, but like, different. Also, wow, Oh, you want a dragon cool i want it more dragon and less kite the current one is a big slab of resin in a triangle shape i want like look at the new aos dragon with the little clergyman on top throw the cringe lord out make that dragon more tyranny what are you thinking eric what do you want i'll never say no to more big monsters just in general but i think it'd be neat to have something else to the swarm aspect you know, let's get some more cute little termagant style things. So we've got shooty ones. We've got talony melee ones. And now we have neurogons technically, which are sort of synapsy brainy ones, but their rules are super basic. Yeah. They're kind of nothing ones, if I'm being honest. And we have barb gaunts too, which are a little bit of a mortary one. Though I'd say they're almost too elite to call them part of the swarm part. I wouldn't call that part of the swarm. But they're close. They're close. I mean, you can only take them in five or ten mans. So what are you thinking? What do you want to do with it? I mean, obviously it needs to be psychic. Okay. So a big ball of them that does some type of psychic ability based on how many? Yeah. And like, you know, it'd be one of those like psychic tests or whatever. And then if you have more, it'll just happen. But if you have less, it'll be a chance or something like that. Doesn't the jump kind of work like that? Isn't it one of the blast attacks on one of the orcs where like if it's leading a big enough unit, it adds a bunch of damage, but the blowback is harder? Yeah. 
so the weird boy has his Ed Banger weapon. No, oh, that's the one. Okay. Yeah, and that's just like if you have five models, it does something. If you have ten, it's hazardous. So something something like that. Something similar to that, yes. Okay, that could be really interesting for a swarm unit to just get a ton of them to do like big fireballs, essentially. Yeah, to me, Tyranids, it's always been the kind of like swarm style. As much as I enjoy and like can appreciate the big monster, like your dragon idea, I like just the unending waves that Tyranids can do. So I want more of that. I just want more of it. So and like they're always cute. So that helps. All right. Well, while we're on the subject, let's also do what is probably the number one comment we've gotten that has caused this episode to exist. And let's rate every faction's night for Tyranids now that the Norn Emissary exists. All right, then. I think we've got a good shot at uh, the Norn Emissary doing pretty well. Yeah, so just to get back in the mood of that episode, let's look at a couple examples of what other factions scored. Just as a reminder, being Forge World is a huge kick to the nads in your score here. What would have been an AA plus for Custodes was a B. <laughs> Deservedly so. And the Demacarian, which is essentially the Norn Assimilator, fell all the way to a C because the model wasn't great to begin with and it's Forge World. So, few things to remember. Style is key. Legs are better than treads, which is better than planes. Still true. Norn Emissary. How we doing? It is big enough to count. It is smaller than a lot of people thought it was. It's slightly bigger than a war dog, but it's smaller than a full knight. It's about on par with most of the greater demons in size who got A's. It's big, but not as big as some night. Fair enough. Stat-wise, it is up there. It is close to night tier stat-wise. Yeah, it's not got the same wound count, but... But it's high. It's pretty high, and honestly, it's got a better invulnerable save and save, so... <laughs> it's got some weapons, too, so it's not one of those, like... Yeah, the Norn Assimilator is, like, the more offensive one, but the Emissary wins on style, which is such an important part of this, that I'm gonna say they both can have the A, but the Norn Emissary's amazing design work might actually just make it an A plus. I think it might actually make it to an A plus. Yeah. All right, there we go. We have done it. The Norn Emissary officially got rated for the night's episode. Thank you to everyone for begging us to do this for the last several months. Not a bad score, but uh, let's move on to following up on new recruit because the 40k GW's app is fucking garbage. Man, you went from it's rough, it needs work, but it could get there to it's fucking garbage. <laughs> I mean, all that had to happen was they started ripping away content while making no fixes yes that's all that had to happen and that's what happened so uh on the other hand new recruit was one of those like yeah it looks good but it could use some polish it could use a few things here and there particularly what if you don't have internet which i was told at the time there was technically a way to appify the website but it was harder to find out so we weren't really blamed for not knowing that when we recorded that episode however the new recruit team did end up watching that episode or listening to it and I have vaguely spoken to them on their discord for a few moments and they agreed with some of the feedback we gave and we weren't alone some other people who were testing it out also gave similar feedback and basically every complaint I had of like things that I thought could use fixing got fixed for the most part it's not perfect but it is definitely now my hard exact pick there's no ands if or buts about it I just think new recruit is the correct way to do your army building. Do not use Battle Scribe anymore. It is inferior at this point. All the other things we talked about on that episode that might be an up and comer are just not as good as New Recruit is now. They've got a wonderful thing going on with their hybrid between being a website and being an app where it can make an app temporarily using magic that I don't care to figure <laughs> out anymore because I'm too old and a manager now. When I was 19, I would have loved figuring out how you do that on Android. But yeah, it's it's pretty good and shout out to fixing the dragon theme so i can use it <laughs> so specific to you i you know what i don't i it was a good theme it's it's a good theme it's awesome and like i've been using new recruit and i was switched to a different theme and we brought this up and i was like you know what they've done so many other changes i wonder if they've fixed the issues with dragon theme and they have and i'm so happy because that's how i'm going to be using it from now on <laughs> <laughs> all right you could have it you did find a bug in dragon theme on the episode <laughs> 
but yeah, I mean, it's really quite nice on how it just works. Yeah, it's not perfect. There are things that are still like minor gripes with how things are displayed that I would like to adjust over time, but it's like small potatoes. It is less than the problems I can list for Battle Scribe in addition to being abandoned wear, which pisses me off far more. Absolutely. And, you know, hopefully the other ones that we brought up continue to get better and better. But as of right now, New Recruit is the way to go. And that's going to be basically what our playgroup uses because, uh, yeah, it just works. And honestly, when you're trying to play a game of 40K, it just working is nice. Yeah, absolutely go for it. If you do find issues, be polite. They have a Discord where you can send stuff and all of that. Great people from what I've seen have been very friendly when I went in there to say hi. There you go. Highly recommend. All right, moving on from that, let's uh, visit some combat patrols because oh boy there's a new one there sure is so multiple people asked us for our opinions on the new combat patrols you've already heard the one for necrons it was on our combat patrol episode because at the beginning of the edition that one was shown off but admech admech was just revealed and this pretty much confirms to us that with every codex release every combat patrol will update to a new combat patrol so if you like a combat patrol for an army you may want to grab it before it becomes worse not that i I have any reason to believe that would happen. Well, other than the fact that the new Admech Combat Patrol is fucking awful. The worst part is, like, the old Combat Patrol was fucking awful. It was not good. It was already one of the worst Combat Patrols and really hard to recommend. And they made it worse. There was a little bit of, like, oh, there's a couple cool models and then you get the units and whatever. It's not gonna be great and point-wise, it's still laughable but the old one was like eh okay sure maybe sort of but the new one there's no redeeming qualities let's go through it so you've got a tech priest manipulus 10 skatari rangers or vanguards whatever three of the cerebus riders which can either be raiders or sulfur hounds and five taraxi which can either be sterilizers or sky stalkers the p is silent the the p is silent (laughs) deep cut for people who heard this live and it never made it anywhere else (laughs) yeah so that's not a whole lot of things it doesn't look that bad from a model count standpoint or anything i mean until you realize skatari are nothing yeah it's missing a big centerpiece model you don't have like a tank or something but like let's just look at it from a number standpoint and say okay that looks acceptable on the picture sure it's 160 us dollars which is the same as all combat patrols right now which is a scam for all of them and i'm still mad about the fact that they've gone up in price twice in two years after being almost double the price of the thing they replaced while being barely better than it but they're still technically a discount a discount from 215 dollars if you needed every unit down to 160 that's not much of a discount no that's not particularly great (laughs) especially because like you would need every unit in that kind of thing yeah so okay maybe it's not a big deal because maybe they're not one of the most expensive armies in the game to cl- oh oh they are not close you say yeah and uh then we can think about it oh but maybe you'll get you know an actual army point wise out of it 410 points with how i built it and i built the highest point version of everything as the box is shown it's only like i think 385 or something at current points today yeah i think i remember it being like 390 ish something like that not great. Remember, Combat Patrol is supposed to be targeting about a quarter of an army, about 500 points. At least that's what we're supposed to think kind of thing. And this is what Combat Patrol was supposed to be argued as being worth so much more than the start collectings, which were about 75 to 90 US dollars, which would sometimes have more points than a Combat Patrol, but sometimes would be way less, like 300 for like the Slanesh one. Yeah, it was one of those like, let's make sure that the Combat Patrols are more similar to each other. There's less of the extremes. And we'll price it high at like 140 at the time. But that way, even the expensive armies can get to like 500 points. And then they do this. How many points is in this new combat patrol, Eric? Uh, about 270. So like half of what it should. It's not even two points per dollar. This is the fucking discount box. It doesn't reach the average points per dollar of normal models in other armies. And you'd have to buy two of them to go up against any of the other combat patrols. But don't worry, Eric. They made custom rules for combat patrols so that this 270 points of Skatari feels less embarrassing against the custodies. I... 
I mean, we knew that this was going to kind of happen because ad Mac problems, essentially. But this is just so much beyond what it should be. It's insane. Like, I get it. Ad Mac has problems at a root level that needs solving. But you've basically locked yourself to having a terrible box for the next three years now. Like, this is now a set in stone thing you won't change till next edition. So even if you were to fix the core problems with Ad Mac's prices, this box just gets worse if you do that. Or you have to explain why Ad Mac's box is half the price of all the others. Which, that'd be neat, I guess, if they did that, but they, they're they not going to do that, right? Like, that's not how you do a business. It's one of those, that, like, even if they increase points on these models, it's not going to be enough to get anywhere near where it should be. The part that angers me the most is you could literally add the AdMech tank, which can be built as the transport. You could add it to this box and not hit 500 points. And now, I believe the problem, you can't add it to this box, I'll bet, when you pile all the plastic up together, this box is... Is probably pushing the amount of plastic they can shove in one and like the drukari box is like the extra big box because it had to fit the boats and their sprues i wonder if this is possibly in that box already or if it's not i need to see the admex sprues to see their size it's possible especially because like the wings could cause problems you know whatever but like if that's the case then make a bigger box or at least put units in the box that lets you build up the point count yeah or maybe identify the base problem with why this army shouldn't have been designed this way if you weren't going to be able to sell the models for a price that's remotely reasonable. Hey, maybe. <laughs> but I, I think you actually might be right and onto something of like, if they're going to keep it in the same form factor as the other combat patrols, there's only so much plastic sprue you can fit into that, and we might be seeing the repercussions of that here. Either way, it's fucking bullshit. There's your review of the Admet Combat Patrol. Put it on the box. Nice big quote. Oh, update from having a live episode. Someone opened up their pile of shame for us and put together their entire combat patrol. That looks small. Yeah. You could just add a tank without changing your box's size. There's at least room for one more, like, layer of sprue. GW, don't be stingy. Add the fucking tank. It would actually make Admech somewhat collectible at that point. It would feel a little bit like a worse version of the Gene Stealer box. <laughs> If you could fit 10 more Skatari too, that might help. That would, if you could put the tank in 10 more Skatari, you'd have a solid box. You'd have a combat patrol. We'd argue that it's still combat patrol Skatari, but that's a whole Admech army problem. Maybe add a tall boy. <laughs> Maybe add a tall boy. <laughs> All right, moving on from that catastrophe, you wanted to talk about some good lore. Yes. So I've read like close to 10 more books since then. A couple stood out that I really want to shout out as amazing books that you should go read. We checked in like I mentioned Day of Ascension and Being Good Lore on there. I mentioned Watcher in the Dark. Oh no, when I say read, I always mean listen. I'm literally illiterate. I listen to every book. <laughs> Reading books is for nerds. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Gazgul Thraka, Prophet of Wa is an amazing book. Definitely my go-to recommend for orcs now. I'm actually just starting that one. War Boss, I read as well. I'm going to say that Gaz is still my favorite so far, but War Boss was acceptable too. Gaz is just a really good look at orcs that takes it seriously, but has a lot of the orc comedic elements to it. Right. There's a certain aspect of like, you can take the orc memes too far and then it's just dumb yeah it's still a serious book with serious tone it understands the subject matter but god is it fun some of the early scenes with gaz are so good and make me yearn for more orc lore like written to that same level and i think sometimes you get a little too fun sometimes you don't get any lore so i guess it could be worse <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a few of those. But if you're remotely interested in orcs, the Gaz book through and through is amazing. It has a really good cast of characters. It has multiple voice actors in the audiobook that do a bang up job. They are so good at doing different voices on and off. Really fun to have like the different angles of a uh, inquisitorial interrogator thing going on. And you've got like a whole ragtag group, including like a random space wolf and how all of them are dealing with Makari, who is telling them about Gaz's story. Honestly, Gaz's book is almost more Makari's book. You come away understanding that little stupid flag bearer who's a lucky <laughs> little Gretchen. 
fantastic through and through. If you're into orcs, absolutely go read the Gaz book. Yeah, so I'm probably going to be reading that one next. I sort of started it a little bit, but then I decided to read Brutal Cunning because it was shorter. (laughs) What's the, like, actual, like... Is it Gaz's story? It's essentially a Gaz biography that goes through current event. Okay. It ends after Gaz gets killed, in air quotes, by uh, the upstart space puppy. Okay. So it's a long-term kind of story. It is like a 40,000-foot view of Gaz's life up through contemporary 40K. It definitely yearns for a sequel. Like, I would absolutely go for Gaz 2. I would expect there to be more gas in the future he's supposed to be the big boss and i think that there's other people not just me that's interested in orc books that are fun so there should be an audience out there another book for a unique angle you probably haven't read from before more so in this case is rites of passage rites of passage is a book about the navigators right the navigators they're the warp fuckers that don't get lost you're correct <laughs> <laughs> they look to the emperor. Shine, O oh great emperor. Lead the way. Shine bright like a diamond. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's that's a navigator to me. I think I fucking nailed it. All right. So the navigators essentially are mutants who have a third eye that can see the warp instead of seeing reality. It also has a death laser. That's a thing you just have to know about navigators. You know what? I'll accept it. It's 40K. You play Grey Knights. Yeah. <laughs> Makes sense. Death laser, third eye, you know. Yeah. That whole thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the navigators are indeed the mutants that allow for interstellar travel in 40k for the Imperium because they can navigate the warp without just running into a giant monster that eats you. That's always beneficial. Rites of Passage deals with the fact that these navigator houses are like their inbred noble houses and it's dealing with the importance of passing the house over to the correct person after the old one croaks at the beginning. Okay. And then it, it evolves into like an intrigue type plot and then there's, you know, the B plot ever building threat of something else to show again where the use of navigators are and then blah 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 so it's a bunch of like politics kind of stuff going on not just i shot my bolter no it is mostly politics nice which i like it up to a point and then no it i will say this i like it better when the rogue trader is a main character and after you've read the book you'll understand what i'm saying before you read the book you're not thinking of what happens don't worry <laughs> It's a twist. It's a twist, but it's not the one that you immediately think of. But after a point, I feel like it loses some of the glamour. So is this a standalone book? It is a standalone book. It is an encapsulated story. I would highly recommend it as a one-off book if someone wants to view the 40k universe from a different angle. Is there any, like, other outside lore that, like, leaks in, you know? Like, oh, hey, there's a call-out to Cadia, or there's a call-out to whatever. It is entirely encapsulated. Like, if you understand the very basics of the Imperium, you're good. It could be set in any old IP, and it tells you enough info that it can get you into the IP, which is why it works well. That is nice. And the last one, don't spoil this for me, in case I don't have time to read this weekend, but I am three hours from the end of the Fabius Bile trilogy. The most recommended two things for me to read from that original episode were the Fabius Bile trilogy and the Night Lords trilogy. I decided to finally try the Fabius Bile trilogy because I had a long flight. I have been hooked to this trilogy. It's so good. I expected like generic Space Marine Bolter porn because it had a Space Marine on the cover and I know 99% likelihood that means it's going to be shitty Bolter porn. That is incorrect. This is a very character-driven story with not too much action. Secret Harlequin trilogy, by the way. Ooh, exciting. My brother and I both had the same reaction of like, you don't expect at the beginning of the book for it to be so heavy on Harlequins and it just keeps going. And you're like, oh, why didn't anyone tell me? Why is there not Harlequins on the covers of these books? I may have actually read them. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you see, Brad, GW is trying to make them disappear. But Bile is one of the characters that in the Chaos episode, I mentioned like Bile's kind of neat, but I only vaguely know him from the Drukhari angle. I remember you had brought it up a couple times. And in relation to that, people were telling me you'd need to read the Fabius Bile books, Brad. And now that I'm almost to the end of the third one, I understand why you were saying that. I get it now. Thank you. So the Bile trilogy being like an actual 
actual story point in 40k as opposed to like the rites of passage which was just like here's a story in the siding so the bile trilogy is more typical 40k the trilogy takes place all before 40k it is between 30k and 40k it is about the change from the horus heresy era to the 40k imperium right all right all the books take place hundreds to thousand year apart i think they're all hundreds of years apart but they involve large named characters who i'm sure a lot of people are already vaguely aware but in this book series is where bile and Trazen meet bile meets fulgrim this is where the fulgrim clone memes all come from a whole bunch of other stuff that's somewhat important bile and the drukari all this stuff occurs in this trilogy okay but at the same time it's standard 40k lore where you know these things and some of these probably existed in a snippet in a codex in fourth edition or some garbage <laughs> okay and now they're in a book series fair enough the one thing i will say that i haven't had an issue with but i wonder if we gave this to cactar editor for the show who has been on the show see the first faction building episode when he read alfarius which i recommended to him he was very lost because he didn't know 30k at all ah. and it takes place at the beginning of the horus heresy slash during the great crusade which i didn't really think about because i take that stuff for granted the bile trilogy because everyone was alive for 30k constantly brings up things that happened i'm sure in the 45th book of the horus heresy <laughs> I'm not going to go read it. No, you just read all the wikis and... I didn't have to for this. You get the point. Like when it gets brought up, you're like, got it. You guys lost on Harmony. Okay. So long as you have the general idea of Horus Heresy and things happened, then you'll be able to slot it in well enough. Yeah. And there, there's a point like in this third book where Bile and one of the other Emperor's children are chit-chatting as they do. And one of them is like, it makes you almost wish we had hadn't won the such and such battle. I'm like, okay, I get it. Something happened during that battle that made you guys fall to chaos. Got it. Or the price was Fulgrim's soul or some garbage. Don't care about 30k lore, but I got it. I can understand from that sentence and context. Got it. Probably is fantastic for those of you who actually love the war of that. Then you're like, oh my god, the thing, it's not the thing, but unnecessary to know. But outside of that, it's just a very character-driven series of events in a larger, half-connected story. I know you haven't really read Dresden Files, but it has that feel to me of where, you know, book six into book seven, different plot line, same characters, you see their growth from book to book. Right. Whatever other equivalent you want. But to me, Dresden Files is my go-to. Yeah. The story is encapsulated in its own thing, but story to story, there's like a larger theme going on that links it all together. All right. So, I mean, that sounds like you've got a pretty good recommendation for several books. I'm not going to get on board of doing a book club on a trilogy, Brad. So on the book club topic, this is one that we've gotten asked about a lot. Are we doing more book club episodes or did it do so bad? We'll never do one. And we don't care if it does bad guys. We, we knew book club episode was going to do worse than other episodes, especially for a book that's been out <laughs> basically as long as we played 40 K whatever we're going going to do more of them they're just not going to be you know every week or every month or anything it'll be spread out yeah my top pick right now not having read it yet will be like fall of cadia it's new it's by an author i trust to have good writing skills and it's about a major event so like most people should be on board with this it's an imperium based book so all of the worst parts of the audience i mean so the imperium players can feel involved and primarily the author is selling it more than the interest in Cadia, but hey, we get to watch Cadia finally die <laughs> for real this time. This is actually, this is an interesting thing to bring up. Cadia explodes in 2017, right? Like that's, that's like the big plot point beginning of Primaris era, death of Boomer 40k, all good things. All good things. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, continue. Uh, <laughs> but Cadia died in 2017. It has never been the main plot of a book. It's happened in the background in several books. Right. It obviously, I was told, was in a fucking campaign book in 19 Dickity 2. I don't care. It's not sold on shelves. I can't go on Audible and fucking read it until now. They were like, hey, what's a major event that we forgot to write a book about? <laughs> oh, how about the fall of fucking Cadia? You know that thing that, like, <laughs> so many other 
other things are referenced around. So they went, they got the best author they could, and they had them write a book about the major event. That would be one of my top picks. I haven't read it yet, but I'll go out on a limb. But on a similar thing, Day of Ascension is one that I'm going to throw out as a uh, possibility. Yes. Pronounce the author's name for the nope. entire audience. Nope. Nope. I'll say Robert Rath for Fall of Cadia. Oh, fuck off. Yeah, right. Adrian Tchaikovsky. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit, you got it. I can't pronounce that name. I'm sure that's wrong, but it's close enough. It's close enough that I was like, that's his name. Good job. So yeah, I mean, that's one that I think we'll write down and put in the hat to draw from kind of thing. Yeah, it's shorter. It's very high quality. It's encapsulated. And then the third one you wrote is War Boss. I'm actually really interested in it. So I read Brutal Cunning. It was fun. Brutal Cunning is the old go-to for when people say read an orc book. I would update it to Gaz. I really think Gaz is amazing. Brutal Cunning is a Mike Brooks, though. Mike Brooks has been very good so far from everything I've read. War Boss is his weakest one, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, War Boss just seemed like one that fits the style that I'm looking for, because, like, Gaz is more of this, like, all-encompassing, whereas War Boss feels more like the brutal cunning of just dumb orcs doing dumb things, but I don't know. Either way, I am interested in continuing to read more orc-based stuff because it's just good fun. All right, so that wraps up all of our sequel topics that we remembered to do. I'm sure we missed one and we'll hear about it until we do this again next year or something, but this has been your quick updates for things that don't really need a whole episode to themselves, but are like something that we just wanted to address for a previous episode. Yeah, it's very quick. Each one individually. I mean, the episode itself should only be like 40 minutes. Maybe 20 with how much is going to have to get cut to bonus content. Probably more towards 20, honestly. <laughs> if you're not a patron right now listening to this, let me tell you, uh, this winter you may want to become a patron to hear the other two hours of this. <laughs> we talked about anime. Dress Rosa is almost a quarter of One Piece's runtime. Is it really? It's like a sixth, if you count Punk Hazard as part of it. I mean, Punk Hazard's pretty small anyway. Yeah, yeah. So, like, sure. It's longer than you remember. Is it really? But Dress Rosa is so long. We talked about pie with our pants off again. Uh, <laughs> Christian and I watched Ghost Stories dub while eating pie with my pants off. It's just really great fun, but uh, we got to start heading out because it's uh, spoiler time or whatever the fuck it is. Preview time or something, something. Oh, yeah. Did you guys love the previews this weekend that we're about to go watch? Man, my favorite part is the Dark Angels got new Terminators. Wow. Who could have seen that coming? I hope they reveal an Oricon model. And my favorite part was when they added the Dark Mechanicus. It was crazy. Eh, two out of three still Hall of Famer. We're good. <laughs> 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 all right that does it for us though let's get out of here for the week sounds good <laughs>